Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to the stage the op-ed editor of the New York Times, contributing correspondent to MSNBC, and Pulitzer Prize winning author, Brett Stevens. Uh, well, good evening. Um, I, I have to tell you I'm, I'm in a bit of a state of shock because about a week ago, uh, Jamie uh, called me and he said, listen, we're, we're going to have this little angel night. Uh, would, you, would you say a few things you know, to, to a dinner? And I assume, I don't know, 20, 25 uh, people, uh, not 600 uh, or 700 uh, of you. Um, but what an incredible um, assembly. And uh, if I may say, what a great tribute uh, and homage that you are paying to uh, the writers uh, who are here this evening and to uh, what it is uh, that they represent. Uh, literary culture, I think, it's fair to say, is in um, some trouble uh, in the United States, some trouble, I think, throughout much of the world. It used to be uh, taken for granted that people's chief form of uh, of entertainment was um, came in the form of uh, the material that they read, whether it was novels or, or histories or newspapers. That's just no longer uh, the case anymore. But I think one of the paradoxes of our day is that uh, literary culture has perhaps never been uh, more important to uh, the health of our democracy, to have people whose uh, minds are alive to uh, the issues of our day, whose uh, spirits are enlarged by great works of literature, who are able to hold in their minds uh, contending points of view, uh, and who are above all um, able to respect uh, opposing points of view as essential to their uh, moral, uh, political, uh, and uh, human uh, diet. And that, I think, is, is really just uh, illustrated by the nature of our politics. It used to be that presidents used to pretend to be a little bit more literate than they actually were. Um, sometimes the opposite uh, takes place. But we need a literary culture we need to keep um, this particular and peculiar life that those of us who are writers lead um, alive. Uh, Emily Dickinson, I think, once said, how frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul, which is a lovely line, but it's not entirely frugal. Uh, and it is sustained in large part by the fact that so many of you, so many of you who are angels in this room, are, are committed to keeping that life alive uh, and vibrant and well. So what I'd really like to do is simply to say thank you to those of you who are angels and who sustain this great, uh, this great enterprise in which we are uh, all involved. And I particularly want to say thank you to uh, my dear friends, uh, Jamie and Helene, who have been the animating spirits. Um, of this incredible gathering. In fact, Jamie sent me a, a text message a, a couple of days ago with this quote that said that the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival is, is quickly becoming the most important literary event um, anywhere, uh, not just west of the Mississippi, but arguably west of the River Nile. Um, <laughs> the person who said that was me, and now... Now it's, on a, now it's on a poster in the library somewhere, but Jamie and Helene, thank you, thank you for doing that. Uh, one last point that I want to make, and I was reminded of this um, sitting next to um, my, my good friend Barbara Boxer, who's, who's here uh, with us, which is that I think um, the state of California, more than the state of California, the United States, um, experienced a really... Um, uh, heartbreaking tragedy uh, just over the weekend with uh, the death of uh, Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and, and the seven people, seven other people on the helicopter. 
And it reminds us only that um, life, is, uh, life is short, and as my mother likes to say, man disposes and God, uh, or man proposes and God disposes. Um, but life has also moments of real sweetness. And uh, for me, as for so many other people uh, assembled here today, this is one of those moments of real sweetness. So thank you for coming here. Thank you for participating in this great enterprise. Thank you to Helene. Thank you to Jamie and the, and the Debras and Debbies who put all of this together. Um, uh, thanks to all of you for being here. And now it's my great honor to introduce my dear friend, Jamie Kavler. Brett, you honor us every year coming to the Writers' Festival as part of our Literary Lions, which includes Doris Kearns Goodwin, John Meacham, and uh, Carl Rove, and Bill Brands. And uh, I'm, we're, all of us are very grateful. Um, this festival is the Rancho Mirage Writers' Festival because of the city council of the best-run city in California. I'd like to ask the city council of Rancho Mirage to, and their spouses to please stand and be recognized by everybody. Thank you. Thank you for all your enthusiasm and support. Tonight, tonight's dinner, um, our co-chairs, I want to take a moment to thank Drs. Terry and Bart Ketover for this amazing job they did tonight. Where you stand, Terry and Bart, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. This is the second year in a row they've done it. Um, and I also want to thank our lead underwriters for tonight, um, the two very special people, um, my one and only, it's Mr. and Mrs. Charity, they're known um, in the desert, Helene Galen and Harold Matzner. Will you stand and be recognized, please? Thank you so much. I also want to thank the president of Eisenhower Health and his wife, Lori, Aubrey Lori Surfling, and Michael and Stephanie Lance, the president of Eisenhower Foundation. Will you stand and be recognized? Please, thank you. So tonight's festival, um, it's very exciting. Tomorrow, you're going to get a surprise. We have a new room that seats 600. It's an angels-only room, and it has the most luxurious seating, lighting, and screens you've ever seen. We also have your own dining room. So, lay, so angels, tomorrow, come to the Jack London room. Get there by quarter of eight. Get settled. We have breakfast for you. If you stay for lunch, you have your own dining area. And the best part, your own star wagons with an attendant for your needs, OK? Um, I also want to remind the angels, please don't ask readers to come and sit in angel seats because these seats are reserved for you. You've earned them, and we are very grateful for them. So the last is I want to thank the, my executive team. The man who created this new room, this new angel room, is the executive director of the library, Aaron Espinosa. Aaron, will you stand? Oh, be recognized as Aaron. The executive director of the festival, the fabulous Debbie Green Miller. And, and did you like the program that we do? We work all year on the program. Deborah Deja, where are you? She wrote every word of the program. There she is in the back. So, I'm, I'm honored to introduce our first conversation. Two great authors, Carl Hyacin and James Patterson. Thanks. Best intro ever. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephen King. <laughs> you know, I've only been out here for a couple of days, but I love this. I love the valley because there's no place that I've gone so far where I'm the oldest in the room. <laughs> so tall. So, well, it's good to see you. I was going to say that I got on a plane in uh, Orlando yesterday about 1.30 and landed at out here about 7.30 your time, and in that period, uh, Jim had two books published. Well, I was just on the plane. Well, I'm slowing down. You get a little slowing older, down. you know. Um, I got, what, I is got, this, what is this? What is this? Electing presidents at 75 years old and stuff? I mean, it's good. You know, you, we know we're slowing down a little bit, right? We've lost a half a step. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's the theme, isn't it? I was going to do this. Losing great... half a step. No, we have to save literature. I heard it from the New York Times. Oh, 
Well, I think you're well on your way to saving literature. I'm, I was going to talk about sinking literature. You're not yeah. sinking literature, but let, let me let me just say this: that there's we, a I clock think, here that says how long we're almost. I know. We're almost done. We have another minute. Already. It's ra <laughs> <laughs> It's racing by it too. Um, I was going to talk a little bit, a nice bio for, intro for you a little bit. If, can you sit through that? Probably not. Okay. Um, but I wanted to talk about a couple things. Uh, the philanthropy, which is extraordinary, and I don't know that everyone in this room knows what the publishing world knows, uh, how much you've done for independent bookstores and how much you've done for libraries, school libraries. Uh, and just for getting kids reading again, which is something you and I have talked about before and we have in, in common. In addition to the, obviously if I went through all the James Patterson uh, titles right now, we would, be, we would be here for a couple hours. So I'm just gonna say that he- Oh, is, is my mic not been working? No, it's been working fine. Oh, yeah. Oh, well look at this. This is some good stuff. Th that is. You, 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 Whoa. You could do that. You could we do like Montel Williams or something. We could do one of those shows. Um, but you don't want to. Talk, I can see you don't want to talk about the philanthropy. So I'm just going to. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a big deal. It is a big deal when you're getting kids reading. In case you've noticed in this country right now, not everybody is reading. If you've noticed that, there's a. a uh, it's a diminished past. I, I'll do the quick one. It, it relates to kids reading and philanthropy. Right now in Florida, a percentage of kids reading at grade level is 43%. Okay. California is worse. The, co the whole country is under 50%. And uh, I was up in Tallahassee with the head of the Senate and whatever, and we're talking about what we can do. And um, I'm involved with the University of Florida. The University of Florida has been testing a program for five years. They have it up into the mid-80s. And it has to do with helping teachers to be better at what they're doing, because all through, from preschool up through fourth grade, all teachers teach reading. A lot of them haven't been, they haven't been, people haven't helped them to be better teachers at it, you know. Um, but even in Florida, like um, 200,000 kids are, are going to be third graders this year, and 70 to 90,000 of them will be lost. Boom, yeah. disaster, you know, behind the eight ball. I mean, obviously not all will, but because you can't, you can't go through high school if, if you don't read. So it's a, it's a massive, massive problem. Um, and um, so, so that's, that's the primary thing that we're doing, you know, in terms of philanthropy. And it's so, because the ceiling is so high and that's the kind of thing, um, you know, hopefully, I mean, actually it'd be great if you picked it up in California because California has a big problem too. I thought Florida was, had the worst numbers on everything. I didn't realize. No, that. Florida is actually 12th at 43%, 40, which is that's, really a that's sick. That's but, staggering. You know, yeah, they, yeah, don't, yeah. they don't take those numbers during the election years, I don't think. They, when did they do that survey that Florida was uh, You I'm won't hear sure. those numbers from the politicians. But um, we were going to. Why don't we run for something? <laughs> yeah, that'd be so cool. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, you get. You were telling me a funny story because you get recognized. I can't imagine why, but you do. You get recognized. And tell me, you, you said you were uh, uh, Castle. Tell me about that show. Oh, yeah, the Castle thing, right, yeah. No, I, I, people come up, are you James Patterson? And, I, and I, my, my line usually is, why does he owe you money? That's <laughs> a, no, but you know, the whole thing about fame and whatever. So I was on Castle uh, two or three times, that TV show. And uh, I was on a plane a, a while back, and I'm walking down the aisle, and this woman is pointing at me. She says, I, I know you, I know you. So I stop, hi, how are you? And she says, y yeah, you, you played Patterson on Castle. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna play Patterson tonight. <laughs> let's, let's talk about your experience since we're close to Hollywood, your experiences with Hollywood, which are oh, numerous. Let me started on that. Um, are there any Hollywood people here? I'll bet there are, right? Yeah, 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 of course. You know, if I, if I, I would never write a novel about Hollywood, but if I did, I have the first line, hello, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, make, it makes No, me... they're very nice people. They, I don't know why they act the way they do. It's so bizarre, you know? We went to, I, I went to, the, they have these press junkets, right? Well, you went for striptease and stuff, yeah. you know? And um, so I go out, and Paramount has this press junket for one of the movies, you know. And I go out there, and Paramount goes, well, you better let Jim see the movie, because the press is going to say, what do you think of the movie, you know? 
So um, it, it was uh, along came a spider, a kisser goes one of them. And I watched the first scene and I go, okay, well, that wasn't in the book. <laughs> and I watched the second scene and I go, all right, that wasn't in the book either. And in the second scene, Alex Cross is there and this woman comes in and I don't know who the hell she is, you know. And she basically says, you know, go on out and, you know, stop. He, he's, he's building a ship in a bottle. And it doesn't seem that much, that very cinematic to me. So, uh, and this woman never comes back in the movie, you know. So I don't know who the hell is this woman, you know. So I see Morgan Freeman in this press junk. And I go, Morgan, who was the woman in the second scene of the movie? And he, and, and he said, oh, that's Alice Cross's sister. I said, oh, I didn't know Alex had a sister. <laughs> Do you find that people, if let's say they make a, pro, a movie or a television series out of one of your novels that maybe doesn't compete with Citizen Kane uh, in the public's mind, do you find it doesn't compete with NCIS? That's right. But do you do you find they no hold offense. they hold no, you? Show. A, I love that show. They hold you accountable, even though because you wrote the book, that they somehow hold you accountable for what mm. Hollywood does. I, you know, I, I, I'm so accountable for the books. I mean, that's where I get most of the, the, the insults. So, uh, <laughs> not so much for the television. They tend to be pretty nice. You know? Well, I mean, I had some... I've had Tell people... me about striptease. Oh, God. So here's uh, Demi you know, Moore, right? It, now, it was Demi it, Moore, it was yes. A very they, uh, funny uh, book. It, and she, they're, and they're, they're all... <clears throat> they're all... They were wonderfully nice to me. The, the, the check cleared. It was... I couldn't, they couldn't have been nicer to me, but everything always changes when they, you know this, that is, writing a screenplay is completely different from writing a novel, and they're taking a large manuscript and they're boiling it down to maybe a hundred pages, and so things are, bad pages. Uh, things are going to change, and things happen, and then stars come aboard, and things change even more because they have their Did own. Did Demi know it was supposed to be a com comedy? Oh, no, God. I'm kidding. You know, don't. <laughs> Don't get me into it. She was as nice she's, as she I'm could. sure she's very nice, yeah. Uh, as they were all nice to me, and it's a very difficult thing. It was particularly my... Well, when I went on Kiss the Girls we, out in, the, in there, and everybody was very nice, same thing. But I soon found out that on a, on a movie shoot, the novelist rates somewhere below the caterer. Oh, God, They yeah. know why the caterer is there. <laughs> Well, the director of Striptease, who also wrote this, this, Andy Bergman is a very talented guy, and he written a very funny movie that Marlon Brando had been in um, with, with uh, Matthew Broderick, whose name, that movie escapes me now. But anyway, it was funny, and I thought on the basis of that, but you're right, and they had invited me to the set for a couple of days, because it makes you feel important, uh, and I was, you know, I was still in the Herald News, Miami Herald Newsman, so I got to leave the newsroom. It's just so they can shoot that promotional photography and they, you know, whatever, that's all it is. Yeah, well, whatever, yeah, and, and then I noticed, as you noticed, certain scenes. Clinton and I are going to the, to the, they've invited us for a day, they'll shoot Clinton and I at the, uh, for showtime, whatever. Well, you, people assume you have some input regarding the script or the structure of the movie. They assume that people give a rat's ass what the author thinks, and they do not. If they do not care what he thinks, imagine when I show up on the set. Really, if I can get a folding chair, I'm thrilled. Can you, who are you again? Okay, you sit here. But uh, Steve... Well, they, and, and the screenwriters always have their take on what it's going to be. Like, it's war and peace, and they go, well, we're thinking it's going to be a ballet. And nobody's done War and Peace as a ballet yet, and it'll be so cool. Or maybe a ballet and an opera, a rock opera. Yeah, no, that's what, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, and they'll, and they'll do the, they love the one, they love the, describing to you what it's All going to be. All these people out here are Hollywood people. We're going to, you know, we'll get chased from the States. So, uh, well, know. but they'll say things like, yeah, it's a combination of, of Rosemary's Baby and Frozen. I mean, that's the kind of... I like of, it. I yeah, like it. but that's the kind of stuff they do. They love those lines. Oh, yeah. oh, now I understand the concept. And then you just go drink for a long time. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but we have nothing to say about what it... I mean, do you have any exact... I mean, if you get producer title... No, no. I, yeah. You know, as I say, President Clinton, uh, the, uh, the president is missing. We're doing with Showtime. They're very nice people, and they're very nice to, you know, the president and myself, but no, we have no input at all. So they don't care what you and a former president of the United States thinks of their script. So that puts it all in perspective for you. Yeah, well, whatever. But I, 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 yeah, I actually have, I have high hopes for it. So the Showtime people are very smart. Do you get so. to see drafts of the script? 
Um, the, the first script, and now lately, um, as it, well, the weirdest one was uh, the, the cross thing with, uh, with uh, Tyler Perry, who was a very nice guy. Um, the director was rewriting the script every yeah. night. That means that they went, were yeah. shooting a first draft the next day, which is insane. Like, uh, I, I kept saying, you know, you, you, that's a first draft now, and it's really bad. What, what, yeah, and here's the kiss of death is when they're done, and then you get the call saying, yeah, the movie's great, uh, but we think we're going to reshoot the ending. <laughs> then you might as well just change your name, move to no, another town. My thing town. is, please reshoot the ending. Oh. <laughs> So there uh, is an ending. You know what, but... Uh, well, they get, like, pan up into the trees. That's when you know. They, yeah, mm -hmm. no. no, don't do, please don't do that. That's not an end. <laughs> no, it's just that we're out of, yeah, we're out of time. We got, but let's, you know, what I'm interested in, selfishly, is your process, because you work with lots of writers, plus your you own stuff. You want to do something, the two of us? Oh, you ready? Right. The... Uh, yeah. Right now? Yeah. We, uh, no, we, by we, the time we, we finish, alternate words. In the, well, just you know. <laughs> I don't think I could keep up. I, you know, I know you've got my... But seriously, the process is extraordinary. And it's something, if you, as much of it as you can share, because here's my problem is I have never written from an, an outline. I got out of college and I made up my mind I would never do another outline. And unfortunately, some of the critics of my novels have noticed some structural issues and possible chaos in the, in the plotting. <laughs> you... I'm being generous to myself, but you, on the other hand, you you have a when you write, you have a, you pretty much know where it's going. Um, yeah, up to a point. I mean, I I'm a big outline person. I, I love outlines, and especially when I'm working with somebody else. And I there was one year when I wrote two novels, and I wrote 2,600 pages of outlines. If you can imagine that, it's insane. Then we had the Sunday morning CBS people where they came to the house, and this is when I was doing those little novellas. And I said, well, they're in these drawers. And I started pulling out these drawers. I remember that scene. And, and the, the, the guy who was interviewing me, wonderful guy, and he said, uh, this is crazy, this is crazy. And around the sixth drawer, he said, James, you are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but which is, which but is it's how do you do it is the question. And, and I'm asking as a, someone who not just fumbles, but I know plenty of writers who are more productive. Why would I tell you all my secrets, Carl? <laughs> What would be the point of that? You're right. Well, no, but yeah. Now I, no, I, I, but I love outlines, and I, and I do, and I, you know, same thing in school. Do outlines, and and if I go to schools, to, and I'll say outline, outline, outline. It saves so much time, and to for me, you can read the outline, and it's fifty or sixty pages, and you know whether the damn thing's going to work or not. And it's a lot. It's just not that painful. You know, to have to fix the outline, to fix the 50 pages. To right, fix the yeah. 400 pages is very painful, very depressing, and, you know. And you can lose a lot of momentum in the writing if you have to go back and... And redo the and whole thing, yes. And do it's, surgery it's on it's 400 very pages. Very it's, bad, yeah. Yeah, you're not in a good... In a good but the, the, the discipline required is what I'm saying. And when, you, if, when you're working with someone else, have you, have you run into people who are not good outliners? Well, they don't. I do the outlines. Do. They, 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 they but I mean, in terms of following the outline, do you ever have an instance where a writer um, just says to you, "You well, know what? what I, I've got my own ideas on this." What I will this. do is, yeah. But then we stop the project. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. No, I, no. Mostly, <laughs> no. I, what I do is, I will, I will give the outline to a writer, and this is ninety-five percent of the of the time. I'm not doing it with Loop Book. It's a little different, and. Um, uh, I'll say, please contribute. And I want them to contribute for two reasons. One, I want their contributions. And secondly, I want them emotionally involved. And if they make a few, sometimes they'll make one suggestion and they'll go, now it works. And I go, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's fine. But, but you re they have to be emotionally involved. And if they're not, then, uh, you know, because my thing is always highest common denominator. And if somebody's just going to go and, and, you know, get a paycheck, it's, it's just not going to work. I think most people who followed your career and know you were with J. Walter Thompson for years. What was the transition? From yeah, but I've been clean for over 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> How was the transition besides exhilarating well, I uh, from written, the world of I had written, I, I wrote the first book when I was 25 or 26. It got turned down by 31 publishers. Uh, then won an Edgar as Best First Mystery, so go figure that one, you know. 
But that must have. Is that at that point is when well, you let? When did you decide to, to leave? It happened very quick. So it was like it was like instant thirty-one assassin. You know, it was like getting you know by like a machine gun. Uh, the thirty-one. You know, it's like blah, 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 you know. Uh, uh. And then somebody said, "Oh no, we'll we'll publish it." Little Brown was great. But did you at that moment know that's when you were leaving, or you were still working in advertising? Oh when no, you write I worked that for a long time. Yeah, that's what no, I was going to ask just, you. You know, I I loved the writing. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to be, be in a position where I would get frustrated and need the money, and so I just kept doing. I, I kept doing Thompson. Right. I mean, uh, I've still got my day job the day too. Job. The same yeah. thing. Yeah, because yeah. The, you live. Writers are usually pretty insecure people anyway and it's also you just don't there's no guarantee and but but that's a the edgar is a huge thing to win oh, was, at a young yeah. age yeah well, it was unbelievable yeah i i and i went up to little brown in those days there in boston and it was just it was like i'm a kid you know and it this beautiful little library up on on uh, beacon street and uh Fire was going, and I walk around, and here's Catcher in the Rye, and <laughs> Herman Wouk, and, jo and Norman Mailer, and and um, uh, French lieutenants, women, you know, women, you know, and they were all Little Brown books, and I'm like, damn, why are they publishing me? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's it, that's the coolest thing. Now, the other thing I want to ask you about is because we're sort of neighbors. We're I'm about from in Florida. I'm about an hour, probably an hour and a half from you. Um, we have to talk a little bit about Florida as an inspirational uh, setting uh, for, uh, because the, given the theme of the, the conference as well, which I believe is political, um, and, you, in, and you recently received a, a huge award. Oh boy, here we go. No, I'm going to be nice about this. <laughs> okay. I mean, you deserve the award. I think it was the National Humanities, yeah. National Humanities Award from the president, mm -hmm. who is a, a, a neighbor. Well, it's an interesting thing. Our son, who's 21, he's up at Brown, where they're teaching him to become a socialist. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. But he, he said, he said, he said, Dad, you, you can't accept the award. And I said, uh, I said, when it gets offered to you, you can turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Palm Beach. Uh, Whatever you think of the president, I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, in five years, people won't remember which president gave me the Humanities Award. And, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's exactly right. That was one of them, you know. But uh, the funny thing is, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm really not trying to be political because um, you lose half your, your uh, audience. But, um, um, you know, because I did the Clinton stuff and whatever. So then they told me that the, the White House would probably call. So I pick up the phone one, one afternoon and said, please hold for the president. And I said, which president? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but that's Clinton called, he, actually, he, he, he called on Christmas. Merry Christmas, Jim. You know, I mean, it's interesting. We become, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. That, that was, uh, that was a, uh, an interesting uh, partnership. Because in the book was interesting. The president's missing was so interesting. But there was so much... To me, as a reader, there's so much inside stuff on the Secret Service and the whole... Yeah. What well, that is, was the thing. Whatever happened in the book, if it happened, even if it's a little outrageous, if something like that happened, here's how it would happen. Right. Because so it had that authenticity. How, was, how was it to work with Clinton? It was great. He was, uh, he was a real gentleman. He, um, he listened. Um, and, and, and we have... He, um, for my birthday, he sent me a, um, a humidor. And he knows I don't smoke. <laughs> so I called him up and I said, well, you're the expert in cigars. Um, and uh, so should I put, <laughs> should I put bubble gum or chocolate cigars in the humidor? And he came right back. He said, oh, definitely bubble gum because at our age we need to exercise our gums. You know? <laughs> How much face-to-face -face time? Did you do it mostly on the phone or did you? No, no, we, we got together a lot because I, I'm in New York in the summer and we're about... 10 minutes apart in Westchester where he and, and we went with he and Hillary half a dozen times with Sue and it was interesting with her because I had not met her before and in the context of like four people she's so warm and funny and, and I just sat there as a communicator and go and it's her fault the marketing people she got so screwed it up because they needed to capture that because it's, it's, it's very engaging uh, and, and it's not that, I, I would have tasered her 
you know, you can't do that, that fake smiles to the people. Don't do that. Don't, because people, they don't like that, America. They don't like that phony stuff, you know. At any rate, but she, she's, she's very nice to deal with. I, I, we found Sue and I. Did, did he bring notes, outline? I mean, how did, did you get, did well, you hand still him an outline? No, because and I'll say, bring him like 30 questions. And okay. it's like, he said, what am I, like a, a kindergarten kid? I, yeah, well, these are 30 questions I have. You have to answer them, you know. So it, it kind of went like I love that. that. And then he wrote, he wrote a lot of it. You know, it was cool. It was, it was, it was oh, cool. I love that you would just throw something at him like that and say, give me well, the Well, you know, cool. I'm going to use a word some people might not like, but we went out golfing. We didn't know each other that well. And um, we got to the third or fourth hole, and he had about an eight-foot putt. And he left it about four foot short. And I looked at him, and I said, you pussy. And he said, you just call me a pussy? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you're right, I am. <laughs> and that sort of set the in private that, you know, we would have a very, you know, convivial kind of... And in public, it would be very respectful. But, uh, you know. um, but it did... And that became... That's the way we worked. And, it, we, you know, we could both say, don't do that, do that, you know. Um, speaking of golf, uh, your neighbor, um, did you read... You didn't happen to read Rick Riley's... Which neighbor would that be? The, the, the one in the big house with the oh, giant yeah. flag that's... The, that's the, 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 I read the Rick Riley. No, I'm, I, 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 they quotes me. He called me for three or four, you That's know, what I was going to get to, because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must be great to golf with... I've, I've golfed with the president. Does he send the Secret Service ahead to move the ball into the fairway? That's it what was, the book... It's pretty, it was just, very... No, because... Uh, no, he, with me, it was, it was just straight. Because I would call him on it. If you call him on stuff, he'll go, all right, fine, you know. Yeah, I went in the water, all right. Yeah. He's, no, but he's, he's actually... He's a very good golfer. The guy, Gay... Um, I think his name is Gay, who writes for the Wall Street Journal, he played him, you know, 18 holes, and he figured he was going to kick his butt. Because gay is a six or seven handicap, and Trump beat him. Did he really? This is back a ways. Yeah, he, no, he's a, that's what makes it so very strange that he messes around because he's actually a, a very good golfer. There's some incredible stories in that yeah. book, though. Great. Uh, well, great Rick, stories. you know, Rick is sort of a novelist slash, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, well, you can just see him, though. You yeah, can yeah, just yeah. see the ball landing in the water and then reappearing in the middle of the fairway. Well, if you get the floating balls, you With know. like a Secret <laughs> Service guy in scuba gear. Uh, <laughs> I can see that. Um, Let's talk about Florida because it's... That was pretty good. I evaded some of that shit pretty well, right, Carl? Yeah, you did. <laughs> you did. You slid right... Yeah. We're, we're just avoiding the That's theme the of this. That's the days, yeah. <laughs> Do you like living in Florida? Uh, oh, no, I, I don't really live in Florida because I'm in Palm Beach. That's right. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> yeah. It is another I, world. My, one of my jokes about... I, I, I like Palm Beach very, very much. But I, I, I told you about the town of used to be. Used to be president of, used to be chairman of, used to, ha used to hit the ball 250, used to, you know. It is, it is an extraordinary uh, diorama of uh, characters, though. Of wealth. Wealth, and also, there, uh, there's also... Oh, you know, it, it is a nice mix. And I think you run, you run the same thing here. People who have done a lot of things, seen a lot of things, visit a lot of places. Yeah. I'm going to talk about... And then there's me and Sue. No, Done there's nothing. you and Sue. But let's talk about... The, one of the most powerful books you ever wrote was uh, uh, Filthy Rich. And it was really the first book... That, the, the, it was really the first account of Jeffrey Epstein uh, at his worst that I think has ever been in print. I mean, on, and the, the Herald and other newspapers have certainly jumped on and got some of the victims to talk, which was difficult. But it, Well, that, the, the interesting thing about... Because the Herald did, and they got these women when they were in their 30s, in the book, which came out in 2016, in, in, in Filthy Rich, uh, we had all the police interviews uh, when these girls were like 14, 15 years old, and they're devastated. There, I mean, there's, it's and whatever the, you heard with the 30s, I mean, when they were 15 and they're talking about what happened, it's just, I mean, you, you kind of want to stop reading a little bit. The weird thing to me, though, is when, when, I, when we put out the book in 2016, and I went to... Uh, CNN and Fox and NBC and whatever, none of them had any, you know, they didn't no. get it. I'm going like, what are you kidding? This is this guy that's like a hundred young girls, he gets 11 months, I, you know, what do you mean you're not interested? How could they? The Wall Street Journal did, and, and the Miami Herald, you know, they, they did uh, some stuff on it. 
But it was, it was bizarre to me. How, it, could, how could you, I mean, seriously, I mean, how can you have that job and not see that this is a this was so, story? This, and I've read, I mean, I've been a reporter so long. I mean, I've read depositions and I've read interviews of crime, but I've never read anything like I read of these girls. Then they, when they were interviewed, when they were young, and these are police interviews with them, and it was, the, 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 well, imagine somebody in the valley. They get some guy here, and he's he's had you know with a hundred underage girls. I mean, he'd never he'd go away forever. Eleven, he, you know. I mean, eleven months, and he got to go home. Yeah, they let him go home, and he got to have company. And uh, he just coincidentally, what? How much did he give to the sheriff's benevolence? It was uh, he made. Well, uh, that was early, a hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, it was, well, yeah, it wasn't. It was to be used at, at the. It was uh, extraordinary, but the, this, the, just the, the breadth of his monstrosity. Actually, the sheriff was, there was. I mean, he really went at it pretty hard, right? Or he put himself at risk. Uh, right. Going in, after in, them. in the yeah, in, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, He's right. the Palm, was he the Palm Beach police chief? He or, was. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He really did put his career on the line. But when you read this stuff, and this was 2016, and you read it, now what we know about Jeffrey Epstein was available to be known, and and you could be. Here's what I wanted to ask you: Did, did you know him, and did you ever hear from him after the book came out? <laughs> well, I mean, the weird. Yeah, before the book came out, we were hearing from his lawyers every week saying, you know, do not, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're saying, you don't know what the consequences would be, blah, blah, blah. And I finally, um, I, I, I said to the lawyer, I said, I would love to, I would love to talk to Mr. Epstein, I'd love to hear his side of things. And um, of course, you know, he, Mr. Epstein <laughs> did not make himself available, and I wrote about that in the book, and at the last thing in the book I say, here are the, some of the questions I would have asked him, and the last one was, how do you sleep at night? Yeah, yeah. It was it was one of the most chilling things. I've read some bad stuff. That was yeah. that was chilling. But it was it was early on, and it was well. That got me. The whole nonfiction thing. I mean, you you want to keep insofar as you can growing, and and part of it. And we both do kids books, so that was a real growth thing to do kids books. And maybe we'll get into that a little bit. We have three minutes now. We have. and um, uh, and then nonfiction. You know, with and then I did a Hernandez, and now I just finished a, a book on the Kennedys. Um, and people, you know, everybody reads it. Go, oh, you know, the Kennedys, you know, and they go, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't know half of this stuff. And half of the country, they really don't know that much about the Kennedys or the young people. But it's all, it's, it's sort of written in, with the feeling of a novel because it's just scene after scene after. scene. In the first scene, it's, um, it's Joe Senior, and he's had a stroke, and he's in the, the house in Hyannis, and he's really cold, but he can't communicate, and he finally gets the, the attention of the housekeeper. And the housekeeper goes looking around the bedroom and she finds his flag and she puts this flag over, this true story, over Joe Sr. And it was the flag that was on JFK's coffin. So there's, I mean, just, I mean, to me, it was just such a symbolic thing. Here's the patriarch of this family that's had so many tragedies. But the whole book is just story after story after story. And it deals with all of the Kennedys, young Joe, uh, Bobby, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when it's done right, and when you have the right material, no, nonfiction has, uh, you know, tr is more powerful than, no than a novel, but you have... A, the a only bad thing is you can't make shit up. Right, well, the, the, <laughs> yeah, that's true. They really get on you for that. Well, know? the other thing is you don't <laughs> Wait get... Wait a minute, that didn't happen. Yeah, I know, well, but it was Well, the other thing is you don't story. get to write your own endings, or you would have right. written the Epstein ending a whole different way. Yeah. Um, I know I lie awake nights wondering whether he really well, killed Hernandez, himself or I did not. a book on Hernandez, yeah. and yeah. while I was writing it, one, he got off on the two murders in, in a trial in Boston, and then, and, then he, and then he killed himself while the book was being written. So it was like, ooh. <laughs> And now, yeah, and now there have been a couple specials on, on, on yeah, him. Netflix, that, that was an yeah. extraordinary story. Netflix is doing the Epstein from Filthy Rich. We're, I think it's going to run in uh, April, something like that. Yeah. Um, but do you, how do you, again, you outline that. You outline just the same way you do with the, the novels, or do you? Uh, yeah, up to a point. I'm doing one on John Lennon, too, which oh, is, no. that's going to be a very cool one. The weird thing is our house in Palm Beach, it's complicated, but why there's actually a bridge from our house to the house next door, it's strange. But, and that house, John Lennon and Yoko owned for like three years, which is bizarre. It has nothing to do with why I wrote the book, but it's just a... 
Now, it has you, nothing to do with anything. I just threw it out there. Now, um, is the family, do you, do you get cooperation from, a little from, bit. from the family? Yeah, I, and Paul, Paul talked. That was the big breakthrough uh, to get Paul because there was a lot of, you know, between the two of them, especially after the breakup of the Beatles. And, and they really were pretty, they went at each other a lot for a while there. Their lawyers did, for sure. Yeah, no, they did. They personally. I mean, they wrote lyric songs about you know one another and kind of nasty songs. Yeah. So do you, now, do you? I mean, this is. I mean, you're just in this great position of being able to uh, take a yeah, subject you're interested. Do what you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I wasn't going to in a uh, literary, but just take a subject you're interested in and just yeah. dig into it and go nuts with it. But. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, what's the timetable? Well, the cool, I mean, there were two, the Einstein, this is on the kid side, the right. Einstein estate came and um, they said, we, we'd like you to, to, to write kids' books about Einstein and right. his scientific theories, but you have to make it entertaining. And I go, what? <laughs> Making it write about Einstein's theories and make it entertaining for small children, okay. Uh, but actually, I think the books are very entertaining, Max Einstein. And then after, right after, because of the Max Einstein, Muhammad Ali's estate came, and they said, would you do something uh, with Cassius Clay when he was a kid in Louisville? Because all most people know is he wasn't a good student, but what they don't know, he was dyslexic, and he actually was very impressive as a kid. He was totally focused. He never would drink soda because he thought it was bad for you. He used to, instead of take the school bus, he would race the school bus to school. He wore these heavy boots to build his legs up. He was very focused, even as a little kid on race relations. He would go like seven, eight years old, go to the market and he'd go, Mom, why is this white this and white that? And why is it white? angel's food cake is white and devil's food cake is brown? <laughs> and it's all this common sense stuff and questions. And he never had a big chip on his shoulder. He just would you know, kind of push forward and try to do the right thing. And, it, and it, so it's a very cool, and I'm dealing with Kwame Alexander. I don't know if you know Kwame, but he's a, a wonderful uh, uh, writer. Yeah. Well, he's terrific. Yeah. But let's talk about the kids, because, I mean, my own experience is that they are the coolest audience you can reach. If you, if you connect with kids, the mail you start getting, especially when you're cynical and fairly jaded and especially after a career in the newspaper business and you're not th then you start getting this mail if you get a mail f you get a, one letter from a kid who says you know I hated reading mm -hmm. up until I read this book and then, now I really hate it yeah, yeah. <laughs> now my and they always say my teacher my mom made me read your book my teacher but and it's still the greatest stuff and you yeah, put it I up agree. on the bulletin board and well, that's why you keep doing and it and not just the kids I have had Honestly, hundreds of parents come up and frequently cry and say, you got my kids reading. Because that's so devastating for, no, it's for true. people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, but, yeah. No, but, and Carl, and Carl writes a lot of kids' books, too. We both do, yeah. But it's just the greatest mail. I mean, you know, when I, my, my mailbox, I, could, I set the prison mail to one side and then <laughs> the kids. And the, and, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm so, so proud that I'm the most popular <laughs> author at Sing Sing. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was happy. I had a book that was banned from the, the prison system, banned from a prison system in Texas, and they published a list of it was some uh -huh. one of the, for no reason the stuff that God published. I was so proud of it. I put you probably it, said bad stuff about the prisons in Texas. I must have, but I put it up on the website. I was so proud. Every time you get banned, I find I got it, banned in Russia. That was pretty cool. But yeah. don't you find it sells not in Russia, but it sells books. If you the more you're banned, whoever bans books, uh -huh. just Please, go nuts look. because it, it has the right. exact opposite effect. Especially with kids, if you tell tell a kid you can't read that book. Sure, Mom, sure, Dad. And the next, he's under the blanket with the flashlight reading it. And it's the best thing ever, that, you know. But uh, that I just find that it was a big tonic for me when I started writing. I didn't, I was very skeptical that any, but any well, parent. I started writing because our, our Jack, our son, was yeah. the, the, the social. <laughs> yeah. Future budding social. Um, but when he was a little kid, um, when he was about eight years old, Sue and I, and this is, parents and grandparents need to do stuff like this. That summer, the summer when he was eight, we said, you're going to read every day. And he said, do I have to? And we said, yes, you know, unless you want to, you know, live in a garage. Um, and, you know, but, but we went out and got him about a dozen books we thought he'd like, ranging from Percy Jackson to Wrinkle in Time and whatever. And by the end of the summer, he'd read a dozen books. And eventually, when he took his SSATs, he got an 800 in reading. So, I mean, there... Well, and it, something good will happen. 
if you if you get them reading. And if they read enough books, they'll you know they become competent, uh, which is very cool. Jack is uh, uh, he was <laughs> he's kind of interesting little dude. I had to go out to California one time. He's like five years old, and I go, "Are you going to miss me?" And he goes, "Not really." <laughs> I go, yeah, "Really?" <laughs> he goes, "He said, yeah. He says love means you can never be apart." Wow. And I said, you know, if you say it in my house, I own it. <laughs> so, so I use it now, you know. The secret to all of it, though, whether you're writing for kids or grown-ups or inmates, um, <laughs> I mean, it's all about storytelling, and that's, that's what you, you get, I get. I know when I talk to kids or go to classes or talk to groups of, of writers, uh, you know, young writers that are starting out, they, they ask for the, everybody is so different about the process, but everybody knows when a story works. And are you the Well, I, you know, I don't know if that's true anymore because you read so much and there's so much that gets, you know, awards and whatever where you go like, eh, great style. When you start Great prose, great poetry, whatever, but stories, you know, maybe not so much. It's like melody with music. Yeah. I, melody to me is still what, and, and even you know contemporary stuff. The more it has melody, the more I'm interested in it. Uh, but but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I agree with you because I think story is certainly what drives me. But a lot of stuff now, I, it's you, you just read it and you go, there's, there's not much of a story here. No, and I think, but a lot of the pace is important. All all that all that stuff is important. Now, when you read for pleasure, when you read a book. I used to be one of these people, if I started a book, I would finish it no matter how dreadful it was because I felt some moral obligation that it's going to get better, it's going to get I know that it's going to click. You read these great reviews. 40 pages, man. Yeah, that's... No, I'm... You, yeah. No, I, within, I, I, yeah. I, no I, I can put books down. And, and same, like when I first got out of advertising um, and I was, you know, writing, 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 and I would go to the movies three or four times a week and just to break it, just... I, I needed to, you know, and a lot of times I'd stay for an hour and leave, even if I liked the movie. I don't care. I, Broadway plays, halftime. Boom, see ya. Yeah. You have, see, now yeah, I've got. To me, life is simple, yay, nay, you know. <laughs> well, I used to not finish. Now, I not just only put them down, I throw them. Like uh, today, after, after the first nine, I went, eh, that's yeah, enough. You get sent tons of, how, do you get sent tons of manuscripts for blurbs and, yeah, people will start, you look, you'd be in a restaurant, they'll lay a, you know, like a 500 pager on a table. You know? <laughs> how much of those, how many of those, not the ones in the restaurant? I occasionally, I mean, there are three or four people, uh, not like that, but where I have helped or got it, got it somewhere where, where it eventually got published. So that was kind of cool. I've, I've had a couple like that. What I love is when it's somebody that you know and who <laughs> sends you a manuscript and they're a friend and you and so there's an obligatory blurb that you have to do and, and there's a way to craft it and there's a way to and then the book gets published or it does well and this book Mike ever wrote right and then they come back a couple books later for another blurb and I, there's got to be a rule like a Larry David rule about that when they <laughs> when they come back to you after you've done this generous thing they yeah. want you to write another one as if this is better than the one I blurbed two <laughs> years ago Please read it, because his last book didn't sell that great. So, let, I mean, what are you supposed to say? Well, I, think I mentioned the 31 rejections. Some of those editors send me books for blurbs. Did yeah. <laughs> what happened to those books? Did now, I'll, I'll, I'll look at them. <laughs> but my thing is always, I'll read until I don't want to read anymore, and please don't take that personally. That's just one person, and, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know. I, I have. A, I, I don't. I, I hate to, to hurt people's feelings if I don't have to. Yeah. I don't. I always say that I'm way behind on the novel I'm working, which is true, and that I have stacks of manuscripts, and it's going to be. That doesn't work for me. Yeah, well, I'm way no. behind on the ten books I'm working on, and. Uh, yeah. Well, I make my. I, I make myself out to be almost as neurotic as I am, and right away I see this doubt in their minds about why they even sent it to me in the first place, <laughs> and they're pretty glad that there is no blurb because it could go no, either please way. Please don't blurb. Yeah, right. Yeah, don't away. do that. No, maybe this is not. It's not good for my brand. Um, what is the most fun you've ever had on a book? Which book, when you look back on, on. Uh, as many as you could possibly remember of your books. Uh, what, no, there must have been something that was the biggest high for you. I, I think things, things, I mentioned the parents coming up you know, with, yeah. and, 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 and weeping or whatever. And, and there's different stories like that. I was in, um, in Kentucky one time, and it, and it was a, 
line of people for sign. And a woman came up, you know, well dressed, attractive, whatever. And she did very quiet. Blah, blah, blah. And then she started crying, and she said that mm. she had never read a book until she read one of mine, and now she's a big reader. So you get stuff that, that to me is the is 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 kind of the coolest stuff. And I I was um, I was on a TV station somewhere, and uh, uh, the guy that was interviewing me said, you know, oh, you won't believe what happened last night. I go, oh, you were reading my book. He said, no, no, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but he said uh, he said my wife was reading, and I went to bed, and he said she woke me up at like two in the morning, and uh, and she said I'm so so sorry to do this, but I just finished that book and I just had to wake you up and tell you how much I loved you. Oh, so, you know, God. yeah, that's terrific. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stuff like I, I mean, that stuff really, you know, uh, is, is very. Uh, have, have you ever seen? I know you must have. When if I you just made that one up. Uh, when you walking through an airport, have you ever seen someone reading one of your books and you've gone up to them and said, that's me? Well, the funny, way no. back, no, I've learned that because then they go, I don't like, like your stuff. But way, way back, I had not had a bestseller and um, I picked up the Times, and typical of some of the publishers or whatever, and my book, this is a Tom, uh, the uh, Along Came a Spider, was like number six. On the, and I didn't know it was coming. And I look at that, because this has to be like a misprint, you know? That's so cool. there was a Barnes & Noble about two or three blocks away. And so I went there. And what we'll do, I don't know if Carl does this, but a lot of, a lot of writers, if, like if we go in the airport and, you pick, and you're holding our book, we'll watch you. If you take the book, you buy it, it makes our day. If you put it down, it breaks our heart in a small way, you know? So I'm standing there. The other thing we do is we'll count the books. They, like, there used to be 12, and now there's like eight. So, I, I, so I'm in there, and I go, like, I know this stack is down, so maybe it actually is a bestseller. So when I'm there, this woman picks up the book, and I'm watching her, you know. And uh, she goes through, and, you know, and then she walks down the aisle, and she's got the book. And I'm like, holy shit. She, you know, she slid it into her pocketbook. She stole it. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing I'm thinking of is, does that count as a sale? It does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't go through the book scan. scan Another it, time, I, I showed up for one of these drive-by signings where it's not an official signing. And I, so I get to the front of this store. Uh, and, and there's two or three people from the store, and they go, oh, Mr. Patterson, you're one of our favorites. This is so cool. And we're slapping high fives and low fives going back through the... And I go to the business store, so I get to the back of the store, and they've got a couple hundred books, Richard North Patterson <laughs> books. <laughs> so I signed them. <laughs> oh, God. I, I, have you ever si I signed at a Costco. Have you ever signed at a Costco? Sure. Yeah. Did they put you in the meat department? Because I was... <laughs> They were like, they have a half a cow was going by on a cart, and, they, and these people are looking, and they pick up the book and they look at it, and they never break stride. They put it right back down and keep heading for the cash. And you're register. sitting there, there's nobody there. Go to aisle six, Carl Hyacin is yeah. signing. That's right. And still not, oh, go to yeah. It's the worst. They, they broadcast it yeah. like he's only going to be there for 30 minutes. And there's he's nobody there. It's a short line. <laughs> People are buying, they're like preppers. They're buying enough pickles to get them uh, th through the rapture. And you're sitting there with this, all by yourself. God. Yeah. You're to the point where you don't have to do Costco anymore. Yeah, I do. Sam's Club? They make me, yeah. Oh, my no, damn I, you know, I, we, we do something. Look, I, here I am, right? You know? Uh, oh. <laughs> All right, on, on that note, the, the big clock... Is we either have 42 minutes left or 41 seconds. We have, we have 38, 37, 36 seconds. Um, oh. Give it up for, for Jim Patterson. Thank, thank, thank you, you all. Give it thank up you for all for supporting Heisen. this event, too. Terrific. Terrific event. Thank you, thank you.